Welcome to Reach Out for Life. It is our goal to present a thoughtful and practical Christianity for today, which you can discover with your mind and live to the full with your life. And now the host of Reach Out for Life, Dr. Larry Bryce. Welcome to Reach Out for Life. I'm so glad you joined us. You know, the mainline traditional church in Canada has had a terrific history and influence on our nation. Our guest today is minister of one of the oldest and most beautiful Presbyterian churches in Toronto. Welcome to our program today, Will Ingram. Nice to be here. Will, you've been minister of a traditional church for a number of years. Tell me, what do you feel is the future of the more traditional mainline church in Canada? I think the place to start is probably by defining some of the terms that we're using even in that question. There is a difference between tradition and traditionalism, and I think that a lot of times those two uh, terms get, get used synonymously. Uh, traditionalism often is when a church or a person gets stuck at a moment in time, a moment in culture, and, and thinks that nothing should change from there. Whereas honoring tradition, I think, is about being in conversation with and in dialogue with our ancestors in the faith. Um, what excites me about being a part of the, the church is, in its tradition, is um, that we can be in conversation with those who have gone before us in faith. We have 2,000 years of Christian history. We have the Jewish faith, which even preceded that. And to be in a, a living and dynamic tradition allows us to be in conversation with those who've gone before us. Um, you and I are part of the, the Presbyterian Church, which is part of the Reformed tradition, and there are times when the Reformed and, and evangelical traditions can uh, use the term tradition in a very disparaging way. And, and our brothers and sisters in the Orthodox and in the Roman Catholic uh, churches have a higher view of what tradition means to them. Um, it, it, it means something different from what you or I usually tend to, uh, to, to, to use the term. And in actual fact, um, they would almost see tradition as uh, synonymous or on the same level as Scripture, as a source of authority. Okay. Um, whereas I think that we in our tradition might say we don't quite see tradition in the authoritative way that we would look on Scripture. But I think that we need to recover a sense and we need to honor the place that tradition has, which basically means that we can be in conversation and in dialogue and learn from those who've gone before us in the faith. The tendency in some modern movements of the Christian faith is to use the term tradition almost in a four-letter word sense. Mm -hmm. like, you know, there, anything... there is a lot of talk uh, uh, against or disparaging the traditional church. Yeah, and, and I think we need to probably move past that. I think that, that it's, it's a label that doesn't help us, and in actual fact, some of those emerging churches and evangelical churches in their theology are very dependent on the tradition of the church and, and maybe need to recover a sense mm -hmm. that terms like trinity and mm -hmm. even scripture itself, it mm -hmm. could be argued, is a gift to us from those who've gone before us. Very much faith. so, well, yes. very much so. Yeah. Now, the church is changing in some ways. The, uh, I'm thinking of the Scottish Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church, uh, the uh, ethnic church that was formed uh, from people from Holland and uh, Scotland coming here and from England. Uh, it's changing. What things need to change in the church? Uh, I'm thinking of music or, or PowerPoint presentations or even dance or uh, um, uh, things like that. What things can change? That's an interesting question. I, I, I think that we can probably get too caught up on style and genre and, and think that, that somehow by tweaking or changing uh, a music program or ch changing uh, the te use of technology in worship, PowerPoint presentations or, or, or whatever, somehow we're going to attract new people or, or reach people in a different way. Those things can be used, I think, in, in important ways. But to be in conversation with 2,000 years of, of, of Christian tradition, I think helps us to distinguish between what is just a market-driven kind of approach to the faith and what is of eternal relevance and, and important for uh, truly reaching out to people and, and connecting with people in, in meaningful ways. Um, 
so as we look back on the past and do so in order to help us at the present and in the future, I think we can help to distinguish between what is just sort of a, a moment in time, something that is, can be helpful, um, type of music or, or a dramatic way of doing things or some piece of technology, and what really is, is of lasting value, which is things like the faith and the hope and the love that, that, that we seek to uh, pass on and, and reach out to others in. When it comes down to, if you look in the world today, there's, there's huge explosive growth in the, in the uh, churches in the Global South, for example, and many of those churches have never even heard of a PowerPoint presenter. Mm-hmm. So, so when it mm-hmm. comes down to it, it's, mm-hmm. it's just a technological use to convey the message of faith and hope and love that, that rests at the very heart of the gospel and rests at the very heart of, of what the church is meant to be in the world today. Mm-hmm. What things would you not want to change in the church that we shouldn't be fiddling with? What what are some of those things that are central and unchangeable? Um, I, I think go back to my answer to the last question: faith and hope and love. Faith in a God who who loves us desperately and has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ and continues to be revealed to us by the power of the Spirit. Uh, hope for the world. Um, that God dearly and desperately loves and and love for God and love for neighbor and love for enemy and and the working out of those three things I mean Paul said it so eloquently in his in his in his 13th uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians we talked about the fact that everything else is going to pass away all our knowledge all our wisdom all our prophesying and everything else like that what is of eternal value is the faith and the hope and the love in which we live um as a sort of sideline to that, I think it's important, and, and one of the things that I've been pondering a lot lately, is the fact that um, we talk a lot about faith in the church and doctrines and, and, and all that and believing. We talk a lot about love, which is necessary and is, is important. I'm not entirely sure that we talk enough about hope mm-hmm. in the church and the ways that God's love will help us as we merge into the future. If we can tie ourselves into an, an entire tradition and, and learn from the history of our church about the power of hope mm-hmm. in the Christian tradition, we will find ways to move beyond the despair that, that is usually being um, appealed to in the way that we deal with the environmental crisis, the inequalities between the rich and the poor, war and violence, all of these pressing social issues we confront f- with far more despair than we do hope. There's so much hopelessness. There's so much hopelessness, even especially the young people seeing the problems in our world. Even the environment seems Mm -hmm. almost an impossible issue to solve. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about dozens of years to get it even stable, let alone fix it. And uh, I think our young people are are feeling hopeless. And uh, definitely, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, faith, hope, love, these three abide. Yeah. Uh, hope is really relevant. Well, at the center, and it's at the center of it all. And I think that uh, a true, a true proclamation of good news in the world doesn't put on rose-colored glasses on these issues. I mean, the environmental crisis is significant, but can we ourselves and can we help others to deal with these issues not with despair and not with fear and not with guilt and not with fright, but with with a, a confident hope that there is something that we can do to. Uh, to, to, to make this world a, a better place, which seems to me to be at the very heart of what Jesus was here to do, was mm-hmm. to save and to redeem and to transform this world. And, uh, and that, to me, is, is, a, is, a, is an expression of hope, if nothing else. What are a few of the important things the church can do to help reach our nation with the gospel? Um, <clears throat> so I, think, I think there's three things. I think that, first of all, we need within the church to get beyond the labeling. I'm tired of the splits between liberal and conservative and fundamentalist and charismatic and evangelical and traditional. These are all terms that I think we just need to move beyond because too often what I find in in my travels and that is that um, we use those terms to stop listening to each other. So once I've labeled you as a fundamentalist or as a liberal or as a conservative or as a charismatic, I no longer have to listen to what you have to say. <laughs> and I think that if we are going to be um, true to the, the Christian faith and true to Jesus, we have to constantly get beyond calling each other names and we have to listen to each other and we have to realize that at the very heart of Jesus' way of being in the world was 
um, his call to people to be in community with each other, even when they didn't totally agree with each other. And I think that one of the beauties of the Christian tradition is in actual fact that it helps us to realize that for the last 2,000 years, there's been an incredible diversity of thought and of, of ways of, of practicing the faith, mm-hmm. but we can learn so much from each one of those strands of our tradition. So that's the first thing. I think we need to move beyond the, the labeling. Mm-hmm. The second thing, particularly in our nation, is I think that we need to uh, help our, the people in the church and even ourselves to recover a humble but confident um, awareness of the history of the church in Canada. Um, a few years ago, there was a, uh, a history professor who was on sabbatical in Toronto and was worshipping with our congregation for a year. And he uh, would attend a Bible study class on Thursday nights every, every week. And, <clears throat> and constantly he would say to me, Will, you have to help people to understand the place that the church and the role that the church has played in, in the history of Canada. And he was talking about mainline uh, sort of what some people, you know, disparagingly look at these days, mainline mm-hmm. churches. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, were it not for the church, and this was not an appeal to some golden age of mm-hmm. Judeo-Christian ethics or anything sure. like that. He was just simply saying that if it hadn't been for Christians and if it hadn't been for the church, most of the universities and most of the hospitals and most of the libraries and most of the educational systems and most of the, the philosophies underlying so many dimensions of our, our respect for tolerance and our respect for justice in this country um, social assistance programs and, and all those things were in large part influenced in really beneficial and positive ways by, by the presence of the church and, and the Christian faith in our country. And so it's not a matter of being triumphalistic or arrogant, but just simply saying um, in this era when so often organized religion is knocked and, and slammed in, in the public discourse, how do we find ways to stand up and say that the presence of the church and the presence of Christians in our country has had a very beneficial impact in mm-hmm. many ways. There's things that we need to apologize for, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing is, is the getting beyond the labeling and the mm-hmm. polarization of ourselves. Mm-hmm. The second is recovering a sense of our history. Mm-hmm. And I think the third way that I would say is to recover a sense that the gospel calls us into community. Mm-hmm. Um, in the latter half of the 20th century, there was a real movement, um, particularly in sort of evangelical streams of Christianity, to overemphasize the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's absolutely important, no question about it. But to be called into a relationship with God through Christ also calls us into community with each other. Mm-hmm. It's not just about me and Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's also about me and you and, mm-hmm. and the way that we come together. And if you look at the way that Jesus was in the world, what he constantly did, did was he didn't call each individual person just to be in relationship with him. He called people into community and he brought people back in who had been marginalized and excluded and who had been treated with prejudice and intolerance in his in his time. The poor and the dispossessed and the marginalized and the uh, women who and sick people and hungry people. He said, you know, come, come back into community. And mm. And I think we live in a time when for the density of population, particularly in large urban centers, there's a lot of loneliness mm-hmm. in, our, in our culture. Mm-hmm. And so how do we in the church um, build places where people can come together beyond our differences, beyond, you know, it, honoring all the diversity mm-hmm. that is among us mm-hmm. and saying we can be together? How does the church bring young and old alike to saving faith in Jesus Christ? A theological answer. Or the yeah, church answer, a, the no, theological I, answer. I think a theological answer was the church doesn't bring anybody into a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Um, as I understand theology, that's the work of the Spirit. And, and the work of the Holy yeah, Spirit. And I think that, that perhaps what, can what we, we need do? to do, what can we do? is point as witnesses to what has happened in us and then in some ways get out of the way. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I think that there's some people that are looking, they know there's something about Jesus that's really important, and, and, and yet, and then they sometimes see ways that we're acting as the church, and that gets in the way of, of them seeing Christ in, in the fullness of his, his joy and his glory and all that kind of stuff. And so they might look to Jesus and realize there's something about him that's really quite um, entrancing and enthralling. But then they see a church that's that's intolerant or exclusivistic or um, are, are, are not living out the fullness of what it means to live in compassion and hope and love. 
and 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 I think that what we need to do sometimes is is to say, how do we with greater humility? There's a beautiful line in one of the recent Presbyterian Church in Canada statements of faith that talks about the fact that we do not approach others in a spirit of arrogance, implying that we are better than they are, but rather as beggars telling other beggars where food can be found, we Amen. point to life in Christ. And Amen. There's something beautiful about that is, yeah. is that, that in a spirit of humility, I say, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not going to, um, you know, young or old or, or, or whatever mm-hmm. sort of category a person falls into, all I can say is there's something really joyful joyful and mm-hmm. fulfilling that I've found in Christ. And Amen. I want you to be part of that, yeah. but, but I'm going to honor who you are and love you anyways. Amen. Amen. How can we reach the youth? It's kind of a different culture. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a different than what we came through. Well, I'm sure. older than you are, but that maybe it was a different culture from yours altogether. But now the youth are, uh, they have their own music, their own games, their own movies. Uh, How do we reach them? I'm no expert on any of these things, but it would seem to me that that what I've seen to be effective is um, an honoring of them as parts of the church now and not just the church of the future, which means that you have to allow them to to know what's going on. You know, I I had a conversation with a young woman a number of years ago, and she she had grown up in a Presbyterian church, actually, and we sat down and talked one time about sort of the, the... good old staid Presbyterian order of worship. And no one had ever sat down with her and said, why is it that we start with a call to worship? Mm -hmm. And why is it that we move through prayers of adoration and confession into hearing the word preached and then responding with our offerings and with being sent into the world? And in actual fact, that, that movement through worship, as it's ordered in many traditions, is actually a beautiful mirroring of the soul and its relationship with God. And she'd never had a chance to, to have the, the conversation about why we do the things that we do the way mm-hmm. that we do them. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that's one way to start, is to, to allow um, ourselves and young people to, to be in conversation at that level. And, and then also give them ways to, to put their faith into action. We all need it. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. And, and I do think that, that so often particularly in the teenage years, to, to allow them to experience whether it is uh, some compassionate act of service or visiting with an elderly person in a, in a hospital room and helping them then to, to reflect on that theologically and say, what is the connection between helping in that homeless shelter and, and, and your faith in Christ? Mm-hmm. And, and so I think for all of us, it's necessary mm-hmm. to have those, those ways of, of acting on our faith. But particularly for young people, I think, mm. um, because oftentimes if you talk to young people, um, the the most important moments in the development of their faith are tied to moments when they themselves have participated in ministry. The decision to allow God's grace to be at work in a person's life has transforming results, there's no question. And the, the ability to, to be a participant in a community in this world that is, I think, in history, the most compassionate force for, for goodness and for, uh, for human rights and for dignity and for respect. Um, I love the church. I see its flaws. I see its failures. But um, I love the church and I love what it stands for. I love the hope that stands at its very heart. And I think that <clears throat> to be a part of that church to me is an exciting and a, and a wonderful way to live out my days on this earth. And I would invite anyone to, uh, to be a part of it and to, to, to make a difference where it is failing and to participate in it where it's doing good. Well, I know you love the Lord and a faith like that is contagious. Thanks for being our guest today. Here. God bless you all. Thank you. Coming up, our address. So you can write to us for your own copy of the book offered today to help you grow in your faith. And now, back to our host, Dr. Larry Bryce. I'm sure you could tell that the Reverend Will Ingram just loves the more traditional part of the Christian church. I want to tell you something that Will has just been called to the oldest and most beautiful Presbyterian church in all of Toronto, maybe all of Canada. He can do a great deal of good there, and uh, it's located right in the theater district of downtown Toronto beside Roy Thompson Hall uh, near Princess of Wales Theater. Will believes passionately in the more traditional part of the Christian church. We must remember our church history that the traditional church has had got 
great roots in our Canadian culture and uh, a, a great history, a great legacy, not only in this nation, but in the world. There is a verse in the Christian Bible, in the book of Hebrews, that uh, we should listen to because it tells us that the Christian church is much more than simply the local church that we sometimes see or attend. And it says this in the book of Hebrews, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. That's found in Hebrews 12, verse 1. And that refers to the great church, not just on earth, all over the earth, but the great church that is also in heaven. I told the story about Bishop Moza of the Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt. Now, Bishop Moza began his career as a medical doctor, and after a while, he was called of God to become a priest in the Orthodox Church. Soon he was ordained a bishop and requested the um, leader, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church, to appoint him as bishop of the youth in the world of the Coptic Orthodox Church. And uh, Bishop Moza made it clear that when he's talking with youth around the world, he wants them to know that they are part of a great, great worldwide church that exists not only on earth, but in heaven that we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, an unnumbered host in heaven, and many billions on earth. Uh, especially in Egypt, where Bishop Moza has his office, uh, they, uh, Christians there are a very small minority, only 8% of the population, whereas 90% of the population is Muslim. And it's most important where Christians feel completely isolated and alone that they realize they're part of a worldwide and historic heavenly church. There are almost two billion Christians in the world today and a countless host of believers in heaven. And as it says in Hebrews, we are surrounded by a great host of believers. I want to give you an illustration of how alone sometimes we feel. There is the true story, as far as I know, it's a true story of a missionary couple who spent their lifetime in Africa on the mission field, serving Christ faithfully. And when they retired, they, decide to go, they decided to go home to New York City, where they lived as a young couple. And when they got home at the downtown airport in New York, there was a great crowd that gathered there, a huge crowd with television cameras and the press with flash bulbs flashing, popping all over the, the crowd. And there were some young men with long hair getting off the airplane and people were taking pictures of them. And they asked someone in the crowd, well, what is all this for? What, why this crowd today? And they said, oh, this is the Beatles from England. This is their first journey to New York City and they'll be on the Ed Sullivan show tomorrow night. And uh, soon the four young men disappeared out the gateway of the terminal and the crowd with them and the missionary couple were quite alone. And they realized that no one from their church was there to welcome them home. But they thought, well, maybe they're at their apartment. Maybe they're waiting there to welcome us home. And they traveled across the city by taxi and went up to open the door of their apartment. And when they got inside, there was no one no one there to welcome them home after a lifetime of ministry in the name of Jesus overseas. The one missionary, she had tears in her eyes and her husband looked at her and he says, you know, dear, we're back to New York, but we're not home yet. There is a great host of witnesses in heaven surrounding us. The traditional church is not just here on earth today, but we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses where someday we'll go home. The church is great in heaven and on earth. And we have to remember, the Christian church didn't start with evangelicals having con contemporary worship 
uh, in the last 50 years, or with the Pentecostal services of the last 100 years, or even the Reformed churches of the last 500 years. The church is rich with music and art and theological thought over 2,000 years. And uh, that church has great vitality to serve Christ, as long as they're faithful to the historic gospel. And what is that enduring message of the great, great church that God has given to the earth? And it could never be expressed in any better way than what we find in John 3.16 in the Christian Bible. And it says there, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, that is the gospel, the historic message of the historic church from all ages. And as a minister of that great church, I invite you to receive God's matchless gift of Jesus Christ, promised in John 3.16. Do that now. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you. I receive your payment for my sin. I receive your gift of forgiveness. I receive your mercy and your love and your gift of eternal life. I thank you for this gospel message that has always been proclaimed in the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church throughout our history. I receive it and rejoice in it. And help me to be an effective and useful instrument of your grace in the church and in this nation of Canada and in my world. For I humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and be with you and make you into the kind of man or woman or boy or girl that God can make you to be. God bless you. Write to us today for your own copy of Dr. Larry Bryce's new book, Confident Faith in a World that Wants to Believe. This book demonstrates that you can find a confident faith in God from the study of the natural world that God has created, as well as reliable evidence for God revealed in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. This book will strengthen faith for every reader, and Dr. Bryce goes beyond just the academic proof by showing how he has proven this faith in his own personal experience. Everyone who has faced adversity will find Larry's testimony in this book a great encouragement. Readers are now raving how good a book this is for building faith and giving hope in God. Please note our new address. Reach Out Ministries, 27 Ashbury Lane, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y0A4. That's Reach Out Ministries, 27 Ashbury Lane, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y0A4. We always appreciate every letter that we receive and want you to know how important your financial gifts are to keeping us on the air. Again, please note our new address, Reach Out Ministries, 27 Ashbury Lane, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y0A4. That's Reach Out Ministries, 27 Ashbury Lane, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y0A4. Thank you, and God bless you.